All right, everybody, if I can have your attention, it's uh, my privilege to now introduce our featured lunchtime speaker here. Um, I know some of you are still finishing your, your food, and of course, feel free to avail yourselves of the dessert table during, during, during this. Um, so uh, our lunch speaker today, uh, Steve Hayward, is a visiting scholar and faculty member at the University of California at Berkeley uh, with the Institute for Governmental Studies. He's a incredibly prodigious writer. Uh, those of us here who are working on books, uh, long delayed manuscripts can be shamed in his presence because uh, he seems to turn out a new book every couple of years uh, during the time it takes me to get through a new section of footnotes. Um, but uh, equally impressive with his output is the very capacious range of uh, topics and themes he's addressed, um, from biography to history to environmental policy to, uh, to political philosophy. Um, his latest book, uh, which has been published next month on Valentine's Valentine's Day, as it is, uh, available for pre-order on Amazon, is called Patriotism is Not Enough, Harry Jaffa, Walter Burns, and the Arguments that Redefine American Conservatism. Um, and it promises to be a really interesting intellectual history of Straussianism in America, uh, but as well as some personal profiles of these two uh, very legendary political philosophers who agreed on a lot, disagreed on a lot, and hated each other. Um, and have uh, uh, left many, many disciples along the way. When he's not churning out uh, major, uh, major tomes, he's also blogging very prolifically at Powerline. Uh, we, I'm sure we have a number of Powerline uh, readers here, a very influential blog. Uh, but why is he here today? Well, uh, I'll just show you why he's here today. This, he wrote this two volume uh, history, not just a biography of President Reagan, but really history of the Reagan era from 1964 through, through 89. Um, and I think the word Magisterial was invented for, uh, for, 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 this, for this treatment. It's, it's a really fascinating history of putting Reagan in his context. And so when uh, uh, we were looking for um, a Reagan biographer to be uh, one of our speakers here, he uh, quickly emerged as one of the, one of the best. Um, now, it is a matter of public record that Steve can be fairly described as a man of the right, uh, uh, but uh, close observers will know that he also loves the term progressive, as long as it is applied to progressive rock. So if we have any <laughs> Jethro Tull or Yes fans here, you can come up and talk to him about your favorite Ian Anderson flute solo. Um, uh, I think about three people know what I'm talking about, Steve. <laughs> all, right, my misspent, all right, my misspent high school years, I don't know about the rest of you, so anyway. Um, all right, so, uh, so he's going to come up and uh, share some remarks, and then we'll have a time, a time of Q&A. So please welcome Steve Hayward. Well, well, thank you, Will, although I'm maybe a little dismayed about my uh, youthful fascination with progressive rock that sadly has continued into adulthood. It's one thing I haven't been able to shed. Um, it's really a delight to be here. Uh, as uh, Will mentions, I am currently an inmate at UC Berkeley, <laughs> where there is a little bit of good news. Every day that I got in my parking place, I tend to walk into campus, I walk by Revolution Books, which is the communist bookstore off Channing. And of course, right now, they're, actually, they're always kind of worked up about something. But right now, they have big posters for the Trump era that say, we will not accept a fascist America. And so I well, think to myself, good that some people still have standards at our public universities these days. Um, this is actually, I'll also add, the second time I've given a talk at an academic conference on an inauguration day, you know, right close to when the inaugural, the swearing in and the speech was happening. The last time was 1993, out in Los Angeles. Um, and of course, that's the inauguration for the first term of Bill Clinton, coming after eight years of Reagan, four years of George H.W. Bush. And so that day, I thought, and it was, a, it was a conference on political economy, so we're discussing a lot of economic subjects. And I thought, maybe the thing to do uh, is to mark this transition from one part to the other and, you know, new policy direction uh, with my apparel. You know, the official necktie of the Reagan administration was the Adam Smith necktie. It's the only necktie Ed Meese ever wore. Uh, George Schultz used to wear it sometimes because he used to, you know, went from his days teaching at the University of Chicago Business School. And so I got up. And first thing I did was take off my Adam Smith necktie as a sort of symbol of what was you know, going away and who knows what will become next. And so for today, I thought, ah, maybe I should wear a Donald Trump tie, especially one of the ones that has the tag on it that says, made in China. <laughs> it's an illustration of some of the problems uh, <laughs> that he's made for himself. Um, 
And again, this is, this is just not a Donald Trump tie. It turns out they're, they're not hard to get, but it's kind of weird right now. They range in prices from very cheap online, like $12 to up to like $80. And as you might guess, if you look these things up online, they take a while to get delivered because no one's actually selling them or stocking them anymore. They gotta be ordered from some wholesale warehouse. But then the best part is, and if you have time and like this kind of free amusement, just go read the comment threads. <laughs> You know, it's like everything else in on, on, online these days. It's a new free fire zone, right? Um, so uh, the uh, topic that uh, we chose to have me try to address today was Ronald Reagan and conservatives, which is, you know, sort of broad but also obvious theme. Um, and I think I'll begin an analysis by citing a remark from you know, January 1989, as Reagan's leaving office from one of his White House aides that goes as follows. The Reagan years will be for conservatives what the Kennedy years remained for liberals. The reference point, the breakthrough experience, a conservative Camelot. I think that's certainly how, certainly conservatives and Republicans look back on the Reagan years today with great affection and nostalgia, that's obvious. Who said that? It was a fellow named Mitch Daniels who was the White House political director in Reagan's second term, and of course better known now as the highly successful two-term governor of Indiana, and more recently as the president of Purdue University, where he likewise he's performing spectacularly. But he added in his next sentence the following. At the same time, no lesson is plainer than that the damage of decades cannot be repaired in any one administration, end quote. I say that not to engage the specter much hoped for by many conservatives today that the administration now an hour old uh, will be Reagan three, uh, but rather I want to recall that quotation of disappointment you might say um, uh, to frame an estimation of Reagan on two related grounds. Uh, first, some of the Maybe there's three grounds. There's some of the disappointment with Reagan among conservatives at the end of his term or you know, things left undone, things done wrong, things done badly. Especially I'll say things done wrong. I do remember Newt Gingrich telling me the story once, very illustrative of Reagan's character. This is around 87 or maybe early 88. And Newt, of course, younger guy then, sort of know what he was doing in the 80s. He's at a meeting with Reagan, he's complaining, and they're, they're finishing, they're walking out, and you can't stop Newt, right? He's complaining bitterly about things that have been done wrong and things that were not done at all. Typical Reagan, instead of being oh, you know, offended or whatever, Newt told me the story once, Reagan puts his arm around him in the usual way, says, well, Newt, there's some things y'all are just gonna have to do after I'm gone, you know, reflecting his patience and realism and so forth. But I think more deeply, two things about him, one is, Reagan was a very unorthodox conservative, maybe even heterodox conservative. I think he's utterly unique. I do like to say he's an American conservative. I'll say more about that in a moment. But one of the ways that you see Reagan's unorthodox conservatism was his fondness for quoting <clears throat> the famous statement by Tom Paine, which he did over and over again, and which he did from like the 1950s on. It wasn't a thing from the White House years. We have it in our power to begin the world over again. Now, that statement, of course, Paine was the radical of the American Revolution, right? I can tell you this, it's in every conservative intellectual's union agreement that you cannot quote Tom Paine. Just as you can't quote Karl Marx, you can only quote Groucho Marx. Um, and it, that statement used to drive conservatives crazy, like Russell Kirk, author of The Conservative Mind, and even George Will, who was very fond of Reagan and close to him personally, wrote in a column Reagan is fond of quoting the most unconservative sentiment ever, Tom Paine's statement, you know, we have it in our power to begin the world over again, to which, he'll, to which Will added, any time, any place, that is nonsense. And that very much is the, cons the sort of, you might say, the European Orthodox Burkean conservative view. You know, you, you, it's not categorically against any change, but it is a priori suspicious of change because most changes make things worse sort of a basic conservative attitude or instinct, I think, right? And Reagan very much departs from that. And often the explanation that was given at the time by critics and friends alike is, well, yes, Reagan's a conservative and sympathizes with conservative ideology. You know, he once said the heart and soul of conservatism is libertarianism. He said that once. 
Uh, but they said, well, but he's pragmatic, right? I mean, his record as governor and, of course, as president is he struck compromises like any practical politician would do. Um, I tend to resist that term, not because it's necessarily wrong, but only because I'm cranky about John Dewey. No one really thinks Reagan was tutored by John Dewey when they call him a pragmatist. Um, and I tend to like to resist a fancy, this is a Washington thing, uh, never use a plain and simple word when a fancy word will do, right? That's how libraries became learning resource centers, right? And so forth. Um, uh, but moreover, I think this gets to the second part. What people describe as pragmatism, I think what this does, if you'll follow me here, is it actually closes off a more serious consideration of some layers of depth to the man. And by that I mean, I think what we ought to do is consider that what we call pragmatism really embodies the classical prudence of the spirited statesman as it would be understood by Aristotle, or for that matter, by Churchill or Charles de Gaulle in more recent times. And I'll give you some examples. Um, another point here to conjure with uh, is that a lot of the nostalgia among Republicans today, which is a general matter I share, um, does involve forgetting some of the frustrations and unhappiness with Reagan at the time. And it's always a mistake to airbrush out things, uh, uh, you know, contentious matters at the times, because again, it distracts us from thinking more seriously about what can be learned for the long term. Um, you saw that in both domestic policy and foreign policy, foreign policy involves all kinds of wonky details on fiscal policy and regulation and lots of things. And with one exception that I'll bring up at the end, I'm gonna skip over all that and talk about the foreign policy controversies a bit, because that gets much closer to the heart of what I'm calling the prudence of the statesman. So the default conservative position is you can't trust the Russians, period. Let's go home, right? <laughs> um, and we saw that you know, Reagan kind of shared that. I mean, uh, as was pointed out this morning, uh, but Susan pointed this out wherever you are here. Um, yeah, there you are. Uh, Susan pointed out that you always saw in Reagan's rhetoric this opening to honest and sincere negotiation which some people said was boilerplate, he doesn't mean it, it's just to placate public opinion, but there's good reason to think he really did mean it. Um, but there is that diary entry from around, uh, I guess it's June of 1985, where he says, you know, Armand Hammer tells me that Gorbachev is different. And Reagan writes, I'm too cynical to believe that. And of course he changes his mind after their first meeting. Um, and so as you started driving towards agreements, this is kind of forgotten, but I included it in my book, you had a lot of conservatives um, who said things like this. Here's Senator McClure of Idaho. We've had leaders who got into a personal relationship and have gotten soft. I'm thinking of Roosevelt and Stalin, but of course he meant President Reagan. Um, the conservative activist Howard Phillips said that Reagan was, quote, fronting as a useful idiot for Soviet propaganda, and he proposed that we need an anti-appeasement alliance to be formed to object to uh, the progress Reagan was making. But it, those doubts were not limited just to activists and politicians. Um, you found them amongst some of um, the, you know, the intellectual class, National Review magazine, remained on cordial terms with Reagan, but privately Bill Buckley was saying, I just can't go along with you on this. Uh, George Will, already mentioned, did right that Reagan was engaging in, quote, the moral disarmament of the West by elevating wishful thinking to the status of political philosophy. And then his column after the INF Treaty was signed in George Will's column in December of 1987 was, future historians will look back on this day as the day the Cold War was lost. That's orthodox conservatism. I did ask George once about these comments at a conference at Princeton more than 10 years ago, and, and to his credit, he did say, well, I was wrong. Ronald Reagan knew even more than I thought he did. Um, but so I, I use that re recalling that there was some frustration, unhappiness with him that is now, as I say, all forgotten, uh, to set up delving a little further into not only Reagan's heterodox conservatism, that has this optimistic component to it, but also his statecraft about the Cold War, about which, about which a lot of very intelligent things have been said and more to come, I expect. Um, and hopefully I won't repeat too much of what was said yesterday because I wasn't here. Um, so we'll do the Cold War for a moment, then come back to his domestic, broad domestic philosophy of government. 
Uh, to the extent Reagan thought the Cold War could be ended, sometimes that's attributed to you know, his optimism, his hopefulness. Uh, I think there's, there's something to all that. Um, or sometimes you can point to Reagan's confidence that we could in fact beat them in an arms race. That was a very controversial aspect of many of his statements. Um, I think you need to step back and remember that it, it was the, pretty much the conventional wisdom across the political spectrum, but most importantly with conservatives like, say, Nixon and Kissinger, that, first of all, communist rule, this we saw in the Soviet Union, was a durable and for practical purposes, permanent form of rule that was going to be around a long time. You know, Kissinger in various places essentially says, they're going to be here for 100 years from now and are going to be dealing with them a century from now. We've got to figure out some way to get along with them. That's why you want to do some kind of detente. Sensible idea. They're not going away. Now, Reagan understood that as a practical matter perfectly well, but I think he had a different metaphysical view. He thought, some people have brought this out, but I think they may not have got to the core of it. Uh, he thought that the Soviet Union was not it was not only potentially weak and brittle, although it is, it's been an exaggeration to say he thought the Cold War could be ended in 10 years. Even he once admitted, I never, after the Berlin Wall came down, he never thought it would happen so quickly. Uh, but I think instead he understood and he expressed in a couple of older statements that have tended to be overlooked that what's wrong with that form of rule is that it is, as he put it, unnatural. People have mentioned the Westminster speech. I'll say one more thing about that in a little bit. But in the mid-1970s, in one of those radio addresses, he said, Soviet communism is a form of insanity, a temporary aberration which will one day disappear from the earth because it is contrary to human nature. And that, as we know, we, this is something, his radio addresses we overwhelmingly wrote himself. Uh, it reminded me of one of the early statements Winston Churchill made back around 1918, the time of the Bolshevik Revolution. Churchill said, communism will fail because it is fundamentally opposed to the needs and dictates of the human heart and of human nature itself. It's interesting, these two figures invoking essentially the wisdom of that classical statement from Horace that you can expel human nature with a pitchfork, but it'll come back at you through the window. Um, just a brief aside, it's always been a curious matter that in 1952, when Churchill's prime minister again, and Stalin is still alive, Churchill said to his young cabinet secretary, John Colville, that if he, Colville, lived his full span of life, he would surely see Eastern Europe free from communism. And he's close to right, Colville lived to 1987. And there's more about that that I think can be interesting. Um, The Westminster Address. Uh, uh, Susan used the word today and why I asked her the question about why you thought it confusing. The word I use to describe the same phenomenon she very well described is contradictory. But contradictions don't always mean that you're confused necessarily if you literally. Um, it, uh, it can mean you actually, to use that famous definition of cognitive dissonance, can hold two opposed ideas in your head at once, seemingly opposed ideas, and still function. I'll invoke Churchill again. I think the right lens to understand that speech and Reagan's larger statecraft that it expresses is uh, Churchill's classic essay, Consistency in Politics. Now, most people read that essay as his apologia for changing parties twice or, as he put it, ratting and re-ratting. But if you read beyond that, it's a very thoughtful account of how you change your direction with changing circumstances while maintaining the same dominant purpose. And so, you know, I like to say uh, that Reagan's dominant purpose in foreign policy could be an adaptation of Lincoln's dominant purpose, which is to place communism in the course of ultimate extinction. Um, and one of the Churchill's analogies is sometimes if you look at this too literally, you won't perceive that someone is like a sailor tacking against the wind, going in one direction, it seems off, but actually you're going, you have in mind that same dominant direction all along. And so, you know, whole books have been written about the Westminster Address, and it was controversial, I like to say that. What that means is the New York Times didn't like it. Um, what now has tend to be forgotten is the next day, or I think maybe two or three days later, I forget exact chronology, Reagan went on from London to Bonn, 
where he gave a speech to the German Bundestag. It was nothing like the Westminster Address. Instead, if you, you know, you can find it, it's easy to find. It was a standard, you might say, boilerplate State Department speech about the glory of NATO and all for one and one for all, and gee, we've stuck together, we gotta keep sticking together. Any president could have given it. And of course, I think part of that is the recognition of the different conditions of public opinion and where the diplomacy stood between Britain and Germany. As many of you know, I think probably way better than I do, the deployment of missiles in Germany scheduled for a year and a half later was a very fraught thing. I was actually in Germany in the fall of 83, right before it happened, visiting the University of Heidelberg, and you know, the students were really working. You think students were upset about Trump today? German students were really upset about it. You can understand why. And you know, the last debate at the Bundestag um, described brilliantly in Jeffrey Herf's book about it was very emotional, and it was close. So the point is, is uh, Reagan and his people understood that this was on a knife edge. It could go the other way. You give a Westminster-style speech, even with the conciliatory language in it at the end, probably isn't helpful to the German situation. That's my reading of the matter, one reading of it that you can give. So the second thing about Reagan that is uh, a couple people have made reference to that first press conference where he says, you know, the Soviets, the famous lie, cheat, and steal comment, because they believe in world domination. And, and of course, people thought this is sort of ridiculous, right, or, you know, something out of the past. And the point was, is that Reagan took political rhetoric seriously. That's one reason why he was good at it. Well, I'll pause here and say that there are times when, you know, you do that thought experiment of King for a day. If I had plenty of potentiary power, I'm not sure whether, and to do one thing, one big sweeping thing, I'm not sure whether I would either ban pollsters, because they spin out these filaments that the political class chase after like a hungry hound dog after a meat wagon, or whether I'd ban speechwriters, who make public figures rhetorically lazy, I think. Uh, I don't know, but the point is, is that uh, when Reagan made that lie, cheat, and steal comment, and you take in the whole comment with, again, his complicated syntax he often had uh, when he was speaking off the cuff extemporaneously, the point is he took seriously what the Soviet leaders said in their speeches to the party congresses. And a lot of people quit taking that seriously, including possibly the Soviet leaders themselves. This is a subject of, do they still really believe this? They just talk that way in their uh, Politburo meetings, right? You know, I've, I've, I don't know any Russian, but I've read some of the translated Politburo transcripts that the Woodrow Wilson Center uh, Cold War Project has published. And I scratched my head reading these things, saying, did they really talk like that? They read like a Monty Python sketch of what you'd think the Politburo would talk like, right? And you sort of wonder, do they talk the way because they think they're supposed to? I mean, the ratio of sort of cliche and ideological bladder to actual deliberation about what's going on in the world is not very good. So, so, but, so who knows? But there's this key moment, I think, in the Reykjavik summit, which you don't notice in the State Department transcript. The, the Russian transcript that has been translated initially by the Foreign Broadcast Information Service, it's about twice as long, so it's more detailed. And in that, is it the third session? I think it's the third one. Reagan and Gorbachev fall into this tussle over ideology that is by turns deeply interesting and by turns comic. The comic moment I'll just mention briefly, Gorbachev complains bitterly that we show lots of American movies and you don't show any Soviet movies. And I was thinking to myself, it had to take all of Reagan's geniality and magnanimity to not say, you're joking, right? You know, he, he kind of says, if you actually make a movie anyone wants to watch, we'll show it, but right? I mean, why would you tell a Hollywood, someone had been from the Hollywood industry that you don't show any Soviet movies? I mean, this, you know, I found that very comical to read through the whole thing myself. Uh, but then there's one point, and I'm going to read the whole paragraph as Reagan, as the Soviets recorded it, which I'll bet is pretty, it sounds like Reagan's syntax. I'll bet this is pretty close to literal. And, and the, the background is, is Gorbachev is angry that Reagan's still talking about the, had been talking until weeks before that meeting about the evil empire and things that annoyed the, the Soviets a lot. Reagan says this, Marx and Lenin both said that for the success of socialism, it must be victorious throughout the world. 
They both said that, and the only morality is that which is in keeping with socialism. That's the lie, cheat, and steal, uh, lie, cheat, and steal speech all over again right there. And I must say that all the leaders of your country, except you, you have still not said such a thing. More than once stated publicly, usually at party congresses, their support for the proposition that socialism must become, a, must become worldwide, encompass the whole world, and become a unified world communist state. Maybe you have not managed to express your views on this yet, or maybe you do not believe it. But so far, you have not said it, but all the others said it. Now, if you pause for a moment and think about that, that's, it shows that Reagan is paying very close attention to what Gorbachev says. And, you know, Gorbachev gave one of those typical four-hour speeches the year before to the party congress. And, you know, it's, well, it's got to be one of those mysteries that we'll never understand of why Castro, why the Soviet leaders always wanted to give these four to six-hour speeches. But that was their model, right? And, and I, I, Reagan didn't read the whole speech. Of course not. But I'm sure he told somebody t to read it for him and probably asked somebody, is my hunch, did they say what the other guys have said? Somebody must have been paying attention, and in fact, I've read a little bit about that speech, that there were some departures from previous orthodoxy in that first party speech of what, July of, 80, whenever it was, in 85. I, I've often said myself that, in a certain way, that was the moment that Reagan is saying, we can end the Cold War right here, right now. And Gorbachev didn't pick up on it. I, I don't really mean that as a, criticism, I mean, the, you know, the intensity of that meeting, although that whole weekend is so overwhelming that I don't think you can fault somebody for not necessarily seeing where this is going or where it might go. Um, and then Gorbachev immediately wants to get back to the details of the prospective deal, so it all got dropped. But I found that always very arresting. You haven't said it. Maybe you don't believe it. Maybe you are different. Why don't you tell me, right? It's taking political rhetoric seriously taking people's intentions seriously. Uh, let me do this. Let's see, how am I doing here? Oh, OK. So let me do this and say a bit more about Reagan's sort of general political philosophy. And it ties to the Westminster speech again. Um, and one, uh, here, here I want to criticize what I think is an interpretive mistake that um, uh, a, a lot of liberal, and I'll say admirers, I'll put it that way, I think in particular the journalist Richard Reeves, who wrote a very complimentary biography of Reagan about 10 years ago. And the funny thing about Reeves, I've met him a few times, he's a wonderful guy. He, um, I, I like to needle him about how he'd written a very prominent article in 1975 about why, why Reagan would never make it. And then here, 20, 30 years later, he's writing a very complimentary biography of Reagan uh, without changing his disagreements with Reagan. Uh, but that book is typical of a lot of approaches, which tries to make a distinction between a domestic policy Reagan and the foreign policy Reagan. And so even a lot of liberals who might have been critics of him at the time and still today in certain respects, they say, yeah, that all went pretty well. We've got to give Reagan credit for actually making deals and changing course in certain ways that have been mentioned. But you know, the domestic policy Reagan, ah, it was still terrible, you know, tax cuts, deficits, whatever. And I think that reflects the fact that so many of those issues are still with us today in exactly the same form. And will be for a long time. I think that's a mistake, interpretive mistake. I think you can discern a unity between Reagan's domestic and foreign policy statecraft, and he states it, his core principle in the Westminster speech. Where is it here? Yep. Right in the middle of the speech, he says this. There is a threat posed to human freedom by the enormous power of the modern state. History teaches the dangers of government that overreaches, political control taking precedence over free economic growth, secret police, mindless bureaucracy, all combining to stifle individual excellence and personal freedom. I think you, the conflation of secret police and mindless bureaucracy in that, the middle of that uh, sentence is no mistake or coincidence. Secret police, the leading feature of totalitarian rule. Mindless bureaucracy, the leading feature of the government bureaucracy that Reagan didn't like. It's not violent and you know, oppressive in the same degree. That's the point. This is a matter of degree. It's a continuum for him. 
And I think the sequel uh, in that speech, the next sentence, makes this clear. He says, now I'm aware that among us here and throughout Europe, there is legitimate disagreement over the extent to which the public sector should play a role in the nation's economy and life. I think the subtext there is what he's really saying is, I know you aren't all as freedom loving as me and Maggie. And he says, but on one point, all of us are united, our abhorrence of dictatorship and all its forms. So he, pretty clearly these things are connected in his mind and we'll argue about our domestic stuff later, that's fine, this is more important, right? So I mentioned Reagan's optimism that he's an American conservative. So, you know, the, um, how do you put it, the cartoon or comic book version of conservatism, and I just say that for exaggeration effect, is, you know, human beings are sinful, right, don't want change. Um, and Reagan reminds me much more, or much less of a Burkean conservative than as a Tocquevillian liberal. Or maybe perhaps Mad James Madison. Uh, I, 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 and Reagan would once in a while quote the famous passage people know from Federalist 51, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Uh, but I think a better passage that I think really uh, captures Reagan's view of political life was the end of Federalist 55. I'll read a little to you. A lot of people don't know this passage. Um, Madison, as there is a degree of depravity in mankind which requires a certain degree of circumspection and distrust, so too there are other qualities in human nature which justify a certain portion of esteem and confidence. Republican government presupposes the existence of these qualities in a higher degree than any other form. I think that captures the sentiments Reagan had. I'll just continue, because it's fun, sorry. This is how it ends. Were the pictures which have been drawn by the political jealousy of some among us, he means the anti-federalists opposing the Constitution, right? Uh, were the pictures which have been drawn uh, a faithful likeness of the human character, the inference would be that there is not sufficient virtue among men for self-government, and that nothing less than the chains of despotism can restrain them from destroying and devouring one another. Now, narrowly speaking, that is the, an implicit rejection of Hobbes, whom the founders never mentioned. This, you know, evil guy, right? Um, uh, but it's also, I think you can see the note of optimism there. Yes, we need checks and balances, but we can do this. And, and so I'll close with this to sort of bring up something that uh, connects Reagan, I think, a little bit to today. Uh, I've long thought that one of his, uh, so I'll put it, I'll frame it this way. You know, it's usually said that presidents, uh, second term, presidents who have second terms go badly. You know, like Wilson, Franklin Roosevelt, and the court packing disaster. Um, you know, Eisenhower for runs out of gas, <laughs> Nixon, <laughs> right? And of course, Reagan has his disasters in the second term, like Iran Contra. Um, and you say, yeah, but that's mitigated by this arms treaties and, you know, uh, the, the radical change, of course, of the Cold War. But actually, I think he was more successful even than that. I mean, the tax reform bill that passes in 1986 was really quite significant. There are several other things accomplished in the second term. Uh, but there's one initiative of his in the second term that was purely political that I think we've completely forgotten about. It was uh, 80, 1985, 1986, he has his Attorney General Ed Meese pick a big fight, public fight. And it was the fight over interpretation of the Constitution, over original intent. And so Beast gave a bunch of speeches, and it really represented an updating of a conservative complaint that had been around a long time, at least since the war in court, about judicial activism and how jurisprudence ought to be moored more closely to the original understanding of the framers. It caused a huge ruckus. Um, one of those mistake, political mistakes is two Supreme Court justices made public speeches to rebut this, guaranteeing the controversy would live on, right, and get more press attention. That's, a, that's a, I think, a political blunder on their part. Lots of law professors wrote the usual law review articles that were only read by other law professors. Um, and it did fit in with some practical things, like the more deliberate attempt of the Reagan Justice Department to uh, 
pick judges. And you, I think you can see this in the backdrop of some of the judicial confirmation fights that we've been having. And you know, it comes up again in the context of the open seat of uh, the late Justice Scalia. Uh, in the middle of all that, and it's also in the middle of the Iran-Contra agony, Reagan gives a big speech where he says, uh, I'll, not only that, but I think we need to amend the Constitution and we ought to have an economic bill of rights. What's fun about this is who was the first president to propose an economic bill of rights? It was Franklin Roosevelt. And of course, his were all sort of positive welfare rights, uh, you know, right to health care and things of that kind. Reagan's was exactly the opposite, of course. He wanted um, four things, two-thirds requirement to raise taxes, balanced budget amendment, I forget the third one. The fourth one was, to me, the most interesting and far-sighted: A constitutional amendment making it unconstitutional for the government to impose wage and price controls, which nobody in the 80s was talking about anymore. And today, with low inflation, no one would think of that. But he thought, you know, we had those in the 70s. They didn't work. We ought to make sure that never comes back. And of course, the chances of getting those amendments through were zero. On the other hand, it played with Reagan's instinct that in politics you want to stay on the offensive, on the level of ideas, uh, which I think really marks him out in a lot of ways um, uh, beyond presidents of both parties going back a very long time. So that's sort of one that I sort of go back to, and that, as I say, has now been kind of forgotten, but it does show you the larger point of, uh, of Reagan's political instincts, uh, his interest in you know, Reagan was no constitutional scholar. On the other hand, I think he did know, unlike our new president, that the Constitution is seven articles. You know, I've heard Donald Trump talk about how he loves all 12 articles of the Constitution. I mean, which version has he got? Mine just has seven in it. I don't know where he's getting this, right? Maybe he'll tell us. Um, it's really kind of amazing. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, a little bit stuck for an ending, but we're going to do some questions and answers. So I think what I'll do is uh, say I've tried to suggest that Reagan is, you know, an unusual idiosyncratic conservative had prudence in the highest degree to have anti-communist principles, but also see the moving parts of the world in front of him and adapt to them while having a dominating purpose. And say, if you look closely at some of his rhetoric, his farewell address, he says, we made progress with the Soviets, but God, they really are still a bunch of bad guys, he says in that speech. And some comments he made after the Berlin Wall came down, very calm in tone, I think, uh, like the Bush administration not wanting to in, uh, you know, uh, do a sack dance in the end zone of the Warsaw Pact when you weren't quite sure what might happen. Uh, very prudent, sensible prudent, as George H.W. Bush used to use that word, right? And, uh, so anyway, I think what I'll do is I will stop here and we will leave a good uh, 10, 15 minutes for some questions. So thank you all very much. Way in the back there, I uh, can't believe I can still see that far. And you want people to identify themselves, Will? Oh uh, yeah, please do. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Mike Schmidley. I'm at Bucknell University. Uh, I would be interested to know your thoughts on uh, Reagan's relationship to human rights, how he understood human rights, how that uh, played into his uh, political beliefs and oh, yeah. policy making. Thank you. Oh yeah, that's a big subject. I think, did someone gave a paper on that yesterday? I wasn't here for it, but I know it was a part of the agenda. Probably has a better reading on it than I do, is my suspicion. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, um, that, you know, that, that's, a controver that's a, just a very tricky subject in practice, right? You know, a lot of conservatives in 1976, 77 were initially enthusiastic about Jimmy Carter. And then, in practice, they got disaffected in a hurry. Why? Because it seemed that he would be bashing our allies for their human rights violations and was ineffectual with our enemies. Well, of course you're going to be ineffectual with your enemies. You, don't, you have very limited sway over them. Um, and Reagan wanted to reverse that a bit for the old-fashioned, practical, but deeply problematic grounds that we need our allies in a global struggle. In hindsight, at the time, I mean, that was bitterly controversial at the time, but you know, in hindsight, doesn't, some of that doesn't look very good. Um, he, he did, uh, I know this story was told yesterday, you know, one of the first, one of the first, most prominent critique of Jimmy Carter's human rights policy uh, in general was Gene Kirkpatrick's article and commentary, Dictatorships and Double Standards. And it was in 79 when it came out and Reagan read that article on a plane coming from Washington back to California. <laughs> 
and he read it on the leg from National Airport to Chicago, gets off the plane in Chicago, calls Richard Allen as national security aide and says, who's this Gene Kirkpatrick person? He's terrific, he, he thought it was a he, right? So, you know, old fat, okay. And that's what Richard Allen says. First, he's a she, she's a Democrat. Uh, he says, I, I want it to, and he sends her a mash note about how great the article was. Well, lo and behold, a couple years before, Reagan had published an article in Orbis that made the same argument, <laughs> curiously enough. Reagan was actually sort of there first, but that article didn't get much notice. Kirkpatrick's article is kind of a sensation. I'll just add one other thing. Um, George Shultz has been mentioned. He's my hero in a lot of ways, and one of the reasons he's my hero is he began every single meeting with a Soviet diplomat or foreign minister or, or even Gorbachev. The first thing he'd do is he'd pull out a list of dissidents or political prisoners and say, here's some, you know, something along the lines of, here's some political prisoners we think ought to be released and we'd appreciate if you'd see to this. So it puts them on the defensive right away no matter what the agenda is going to be. Every single time. Had to drive them nuts. Because, of course, their view was it's a purely an internal matter. And Schultz would essentially say, no, it isn't. You signed the Helsinki Accords. And that argument would play out. But he would do that every single time. Uh, and I think uh, maybe it's tomorrow, or we, I think someone's going to talk a bit about South Korea. You know, they were about to execute Kim Dae-jung, I think, wasn't it? And Jimmy Carter actually, I think the story goes, he asked President-elect Reagan, would you please join me in pressuring the government not to do that? And Reagan did. Um, so, I mean, there's a lot of that detail. I'm, I'm not as versed as I should be, um, but, you know, his view on human rights was more the, you might say, a real politique. We, we have to overlook some aspects of what our friends do. Oh, although I'm rambling here a bit, they did decide to pull the trigger and force out Ferdinand Marcos in the Philippines finally in 1986, because that had just gotten too far beyond the pale. Anyway, someone else? Ah, there we go. Yeah. Hi, uh, Rob Rako of Stanford University. It's difficult to encounter the conservative accusations leveled against Reagan in the last couple of years without some sense of disbelief. There's just an unreality to... Wh which ones do you have in mind? Are you going well, to give me an example? Or? Where to begin? Uh, the Neville Chamberlain uh, comparison, oh, the George, right, George yeah. Will quotation, the, right. uh, the yeah. efforts by Gingrich and others to get Schultz fired that he never seems to remember. Right, uh, yeah, And, and right. frankly, I wonder if... Did they really believe this? Or was this kind of rhetorical excess with a much more finite goal in mind? It's, it's, it's something I have a hard time with every time I re-encounter it. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you know, and I don't really know uh, to what extent you can mark out, did they believe it or was this merely rhetoric? I, I'll, I'll think of it this way. One difficulty is, it goes back to something the press liked to report at the time. There's a split between the pragmatist and the ideologues in the White House. And, that was true, although I think the media always overdid that a bit. Um, but, and so people pick teams, right? You know, and, and in the White House, uh, I, I talked to Mies about this and Mike Deaver once, and you know, the real differences in their staffs would like, you know, they, they'd make sure they weren't, weren't mixed in the meeting rooms. And, you know, Mies' staff would sit on one side of the table and Baker's staff would sit on the other, and so that happened. And, that's hard to manage, and Reagan could have done a better job of that. On the other hand, I do remember a press conference in, I think, in August of 1981, and I might have probably Sam Donaldson, the human foghorn, right? He, um, <laughs> he I, maybe it was Leslie Stahl, or I, it doesn't matter, but the question was, Mr. President, we hear that this Hague was still in office then. We hear your Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense, Weinberger, are feuding and they argue openly in front of you, like this is a big scandal. And Reagan says, of course they do. That's what I want. <laughs> I want them to do that. You know, next question. Um, it, it's the, the simple version you sometimes hear, which is true, is that Reagan wanted to have all views. Almost all presidents will say that. He actually meant it more than others, I think. But also there's a canniness there. Reagan, you could see this when he was governor of California. He understood that you can't govern the country, you can't have a successful administration with just one wing of your party. So in Sacramento, he brought in a lot of the moderate Republicans, including, you know, Cap Weinberger. Cap Weinberger had been a Rockefeller Republican, supported Rockefeller against Goldwater, supported George Christopher against Reagan in 66, and Reagan brings him on board. Uh, and then, as so often happened, Weinberger moves to the right, becomes this fervent Reaganite. There's something magnetic about Reagan's effect that way. 
so, uh, so even some of these NSC things, I mean, it, well, the diary entries are fascinating about him. You can see him tacking there, saying, I want these hardliners, but they're wrong on this. Lots of entries that say things like that. So what I think is, is that nobody ever stood, uh, got back and took uh, the perspective that, here's what I think about Schultz. Schultz gave Reagan exactly what he wanted. And, you know, Schultz had, like Reagan, had been a former labor negotiator. There was some commonality there. And, yeah, it is, I've seen exactly the same thing. I mean, I've actually talked to a few people who say, oh, yeah, Schultz, he was great. And I'm thinking, yeah, you weren't saying that at the time, you know. And, yeah, yeah that, that's hard to take. And, and you're right, that's why I sort of complain about people forget all this. Cause, because the point is, as I've said this before, and I'm sorry to ramble, is that it, it detracts from thinking seriously about how these things work. Someone mentioned the NSC fights today. I recommend Peter Robbins' book, Supreme Command, which is a good history of the National Security Council. And the lesson you take away from it is it's really hard to make that thing work. Just never good. Add one more story, sorry. Um, Cap Weinberger always wanted to be Secretary of State, really, right? Most defense secretaries do, I think. Some of them are, sometimes. Um, and he said once to, Mc, to Bud McFarlane, McFarlane recorded this in his memoirs, and I heard him say it once, that Reagan said once during one of these feuds, well, I could make Cap Secretary of State, but I'd get bad policy. And I asked McFarland a bit, did he ever explain that to you, why he said it? No, I didn't think to ask him, which I think is too bad, because somewhere there's some really interesting perception there that the guy had. And as I say, it's, it's hard on the outside to perceive that and appreciate it and cut the president some slack. So, say that. Yes, ma'am, in the back there, and then I'll try and come over here. And then how are we doing here? Oh, we got about a few more minutes yet. Hi, thank you. My name is uh, Ori Rabinowitz. I'm from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So to follow up on uh, the Casper Weinberger and the Hague split, um, yeah. I was wondering if you can perhaps detail a little bit the approach to the Middle East, the different conflicts, issues, Hague, Weinberger, etc. Thank you. Oh boy, uh, that's, boy, that's a big subject. And I haven't thought about it. It's actually hard to handle in my book and I haven't thought about it for a long time. Reagan hated that subject. <laughs> I don't mean he hated the people of the region, all the rest of that, but, and, and you know, it, it, it was true that, you know, the whole misadventure in Lebanon is because he had a hard time making up his mind. That's one place where, you know, because there wasn't sort of a core principle of, you might say, his own conservative background he could point to, that he was a little bit lost. I think that's entirely fair to say. Um, <laughs> It's his diary entries on his personal letters from that time, which of course none of us ever saw at the time, are quite revealing. I can't remember if it's a letter or a diary entry where he says, no wonder they need so many different religions in the Middle East, because it's such a mess, something to that effect, right? And in another letter to Peter Hannaford, this captures a little bit of Reagan's latent religious sensibilities, but also shows his recognition of, you know, why he would never have said, running for office, that my theory is the Cold War is we win and they lose, that would have been, it was one thing to say we're going to win an arms race, that was dicey enough, but to say we're going to win the Cold War would have really freaked people out. And he, but one of his letters to Peter Hannaford says, you know, I sort of read what's going on in the Middle East and it, it really does remind me of some of the Bible prophecies about the end of the world. The next sentence is, please do not quote me to anyone saying that. So he knows this is a really outrageous thing to say, politically at least, right? Um, so yeah, I think what you might say in a slightly broader plane of grand strategy is, is that although the you know, Middle East is very important and a big flashpoint of things, a little bit like, less so Central America, but, but it was not the central venue of the Cold War and he was focused on the US-Soviet story and he sort of had to pay attention to that and do something about it, A, in the interest of stability, but B, to the extent that it fed into the Cold War problem, I think that's one way to think about it, and it's pretty much of a mess, as it's been really forever, right? Um, I don't think they had, uh, you know, he gave a couple of speeches on the subject that were worked on by the State Department, and he said, okay, I'll, you know, but, um, you know, it's just as frustrating for him as everyone else. And it's not very helpful, but it's, you know, there probably is a good book on it that I don't know. Someone else? Will, I'll give one to Will here. Yeah, well, it gets me to. All right, for the camera, Will and Bowden, the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, Steve, this is more of an abstract question, but I 
I haven't come across a lot of treatment of this in any of the Reagan literature I've read. Uh, and the question is, how did geography affect Reagan's view of foreign policy in America, his role in the world? And by this, I mean his identity as a Californian and maybe with a Pacific consciousness. It just seems to me that California is such a big part of his formative identity and values, um, mm. and uh, and yet I've never seen any sort of treatment of, is there anything to the kind of the California or Pacific Rim consciousness that shapes yeah. his larger, because as president, he's mostly focused on transatlantic issues, of course, but I, it, you've spent so much time on his California background, I just wonder if there's anything to that. Uh, I don't know, I, I don't, I'm not sure I discern a specific Asian, uh, sorry, Pacific outlook to the, the guy that you can really put your hands around. I, I did think that it's kind of interesting that he had the mountain ranch, he always had a series of ranches in California that were up in the mountains, and he used to quote the Bible verse about being up in the mountains, I forget which one, Bible verse, and right. Um, and what's mildly curi curious about that, just from a human interest perspective, is that he, where does he grow? He grows up in Illinois, which is flat, right? The tallest thing there are corn stalks. And then he goes to Iowa, right? He doesn't actually see his first real mountains, doesn't get out of the Midwest until he's in his 30s. He doesn't see any mountains until he's in his 30s when he goes to California initially to cover spring training with the Chicago Cubs. And he sees his mountains and he gets a screen test and you know, the rest is history as they say, right? Um, and so I don't, I don't know if there's any, anything to be made about that. I just find it kind of interesting though that he became so fascinated with high places. I don't think that's universally true of all Midwesterners. I don't think you take everybody from Iowa and show them California or the Alps and say, oh my God, you know, this has like changed my life. You know, it's, uh, that become fixated, but, but he did. And so, I don't know, I mean, I, 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 again, this is totally unscientific, right? It's just impressionistic. Um, I do think, one writer about this who tried a bit is Montesquieu, right? I do think that there, there are some effects on the formation of human character related to climate and geography. You're never gonna be able to really figure that out, I don't think, in any rigorous way, but I kind of think it's real at some point. And me, I can't stand being away from ocean because I grew up by ocean. And you know, I've lived in the interior of the country a few times and I'm always, I gotta get back to the ocean. But that's just sort of what you know. Maybe, maybe I'm making too much of just familiarity, but this is an acquired thing for Reagan and kind of fun, I think. So, Henry. Henry. Now, George Washington University. Steve, great uh, presentation. I wanted to probe you a little bit on your comment about Reagan as an American conservative, because I think it's very important. I mean, he was someone who thought that you started with the individual and built the community, yeah. as opposed to, in some cases, liberals who believe you start with the state or the community and you shape or form the individual. He quoted Jefferson a lot oh. on this point. And in fact, in his first inaugural, he has this you know, wonderful Jefferson quote about, yep. some people say man is yep. not capable of self-government. Right. And then Reagan, and then Jefferson adds, how then is he capable of governing others? Right. And I just wanted to get you to speak a little bit about his connection to Jefferson. He quoted Jefferson an awful lot. Yeah, although often not by name. And so was he plagiarizing or did he absorb the logic? Um, I actually have those quotes in my notes, but I skipped over them because I have too many notes. Uh, so first of all, the consistency of the guy. Uh, that quote you mentioned, actually put it in a bigger context. If I do presidential speeches with students, which I've done in courses sometimes, one of the things I'd like to point out is that Reagan's first inaugural address as governor in 1967 and first inaugural address as president in 1981 are virtually the same speech. Some differences of circumstances, of course, the inaugural address is longer, but the rhetorical structure, the way it ends and certain themes are almost word for word identical, right? Um, so in both of those inaugural addresses, yeah, here's what he said. Uh, from time to time, we have been tempted to believe that society has become too complex to be managed by self-rule, that government by an elite group is superior to government for, by, and of the people. But if no one among us is capable of governing himself, then who among us has the capacity to govern someone else? Okay, uh, Jefferson, first inaugural address. Sometimes it is said that man cannot be trusted with the government of himself. Can he then be trusted with the government of others? Or have we found angels in the form of kings to govern us? Let history answer this question. Pretty darn close, right? Now, I do say there's some mischief, not mischief going on here, but you want to pause for a moment. Reagan complaining about an elite group, uh, we've government by an elite group is superior to government by the people. Uh, 
Reagan expands on this thought a lot elsewhere. He really is making the first sustained argument, serious argument since Calvin Coolidge against, you might say, Wilsonian progressivism of government expertise, right? Here again, there's a subtlety to Reagan. He wasn't against technical expertise. He liked to draw on it a lot. It's instrumental to SDI. It was central to him signing on enthusiastically to the Montreal Protocol about, uh, uh, about uh, ozone depletion, right? But on the other hand, as a political phenomenon, I think there he channels one reading of Eisenhower's farewell address. And of course, Reagan, in his usual way, would give a joke about it. He'd say, yeah, these intellectuals detached from the real world. They're like people who have a Phi Beta Kappa chain out of one pocket and no watch at the end of it. It's sort of a joke, but right, okay. So he's being a little bit of a populist there, right? Um, but of course, in ideological and partisan terms, he's talking about, it's not a categorical attack on Democrats, but to the extent that liberalism, progressive ideology is associated with Democratic Party, that's an attack on the party he's just beaten, right? So to Jefferson, when Jefferson says, or have we found angels in the form of kings to govern him? Uh, yes, that's an echo of Federalist 51, but it's also an attack on the Federalist Party, right? Who are very monarchical and authoritarian in their views. I, mean, I, I, th I think that's a fair reading of it. Now it's, it's done in the, the gentler way of the, American, the style of American political rhetoric where we don't have our brass knuckles for these arguments. But I think that's in the background there, and that's another level that's, I think, kind of interesting. I have no idea whether Reagan was self-consciously quoting Jefferson or whether he absorbed the logic, because there's so many areas where you can see that Reagan had absorbed the logic of people who came before him and was capable of restating it in his own words and his own thoughts. And, and by the way, if you ever asked him, he wouldn't tell you. No one ever thought to, but um, you know, he, was always, he always conceded. The standard cliche, which is right, is he liked being underestimated. Uh, he would often would not tell you what books he was reading, or he'd tell you he was reading Zane Gray's latest novel, which was true, but he wouldn't tell you about a serious book he was reading for weird reasons. And you know, a lot of people have ex explored this and come up with decent theories, and who knows. But if you'd asked him, you know, he he might say, "Oh, I read some, you know, I don't know. That's right. It's, I, you know, the little book I've written, I've sort of uh, noticed a lot of parallels with Churchill's thought." I mentioned a couple of them here today. Um, and did he read Churchill carefully? I don't know, maybe a little. But at some point, their wiring ran along the same track. That's what I think, anyway. Let's do one more maybe, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, we're almost out of time. A quick one, I'll, I'll try to give a crisper answer if anyone has one. Otherwise, here we go. Yeah. Uh, maybe not a question, no time to develop it here, but uh. a point on Reagan and religion, Reagan and institutions, yeah. Reagan in an understanding of the Cold War. One of the things that I did, I dealt with, um, back in State Department days, with the issue of shall we or shall we not try fighting uh, also a Republican conservative, uh, religious conservatives, shall we have an embassy to the Holy See? Oh, and Reagan yeah. always had confidence that it could be done. Others, we, uh, the professionals thought, probably not, because Jerry Falwell and mm. the religious right had always been against oh. an embassy to the church. But, but Reagan went through 81, 82, 83, 84, and we got an embassy to the Holy See. Reagan, Bill Wilson, a kind of yeah. instinctive feel that this would be important in the Cold War. I just started a comment, maybe you right. have a comment, but this is something to be developed and something that, that I lived, and I have to tell you, I was skeptical that, that Reagan could do it. He had this kind of simplistic, if that's a, a word, that it could be done, and this relationship with John Paul II would be incredibly important. Right, oh, that's a great comment. That could be a whole panel sometime. I um, know, we need a whole. Yeah, well, very quickly, uh, I knew Bill Wilson a little bit and talked to him at some length about it once in the mid-90s, he died what? I yeah, I mean, he said he had a lot of interesting things to say about that, some of it off the record. Um, Reagan's religion is hard to make out, it's kind of generic. I've heard a couple of people trying to make a case based on sort of circumstantial things that he's actually sort of a closet Catholic I don't know that, I may, who knows, but, um, but he took the matter seriously. Wilson, of course, very much so, right? Um, uh, I'll just end with a joke. I, I think I, <laughs> it really is a joke. 
If I'd been around the time, I was a stu graduate student, but I'd been around the time in your position, I might have been against an, a, a, a formal um, embassy to the Vatican on the view that the State Department would screw it up. Um, and what I really sort of mean, not, I don't mean that as sort of your, your usual, you know, we hate the State Department thing, but uh, it is true, and I think maybe some people made some references to it here today about Poland, that, uh, you know, Reagan's uh, you know, the CIA with Casey and Bill Clark and trying to assist solidarity, they actually worked a lot more through the Vatican and the AFL-CIO than they did the CIA. You know, don't, don't let the State Department of CIA, there's actually a famous story, fam I have a famous story, I what I know of somebody going to Casey with an ID and Casey saying, that's a great idea, but don't let the CIA know about it. You know, let's, so, I mean, I say that facetiously, but, exactly right. yeah, right, right. Anyway, thank you all very much. Thank you, Bill, this has been fun. Okay, everyone, and uh, we've just got a, a few minutes uh, to spare here to grab another coffee, a little bit more of the uh, dessert goodies.